one of the first things you notice when you sit down to meditate is that your mind wanders. You make up your mind to focus it on the breath, and a few breaths later it's someplace else. And that, the Buddha said, contains a lot of the problem right there. Not just in the attempt to concentrate the mind, but the fact of wandering. That's what samsara is. The mind wanders pretty aimlessly, too. It has aims, but if you were to draw a map of its aims, it would head off in all sorts of different directions. And it wouldn't be a problem if there weren't suffering and stress inherent in all of this. So that's what we want to learn about. As long as we don't see the suffering and stress, realize that it's implicit in every kind of wandering there is, we're going to keep on wandering. Even if you got the mind nicely concentrated, you've wandered into a particular state. And it's a state where you can stay for a long time. But eventually it's going to start falling apart. Even you can maintain that state throughout this lifetime and get to be reborn in the corresponding Brahma world, it falls apart. And then you wander someplace else. And in the process of wandering, you create a lot of things. This is what the whole issue of becoming and birth is about. There's a feeling, and then there's a craving associated with the feeling, either to maintain it or to destroy it. Then, then you create the sense of yourself as both the consumer of the feeling, the person who's experiencing the feeling, and the person who has to do something about the feeling, either to maintain it or to get rid of it. And in creating your sense of self, there's also the creation of the world in which that self functions. In fact, the world often gets created first, and then you take birth in that. That's what becoming is. You create these worlds in the mind, or you tune into particular worlds when the mind reaches death. Craving carries it over into another state of becoming. It's, craving is called the guide in a lot of a lot of passages in the canon. But again, often the guide, is the guide is blind. The more blind it is, the more suffering it creates. So what we've got to learn how to do is to give eyes to our craving. That's the first step. Because as long as you're going to Wander, you might as well wander to good places. Create good places. Create a good, wise sense of your own self. Because what is your sense of self? It's this strategy to create happiness, either by maintaining particular feelings of pleasure or trying to get rid of feelings of pain. The self is not just a grabber. A lot of people make that mistake. They think that yourself is what grabs onto things and not self is what lets go. But yourself can also let go. You decide, I don't like this, you want to get rid of it. Yourself can even want to annihilate itself. But then it turns out that annihilation is also another state. There are passages in the canon where people take contemplation of not self and end up in this, the dimension of nothingness, which it turns out is another kind of state. So that falls apart, and they try something else. So you want to look at the problem and see what you can do about it. This, the Buddha was primarily a problem solver. He wasn't trying to map everything out. 
because the more you map things out, of course, the more states of becoming you create. Even that sense of place is a, pro is a part of the state of becoming. You situate yourself in a feeling, and then you build a world around it, you build yourself around it, because there's a spot that's there. That's the becoming. So instead of creating a there, and once there's a there, then there's a here and there's an over there, and as long as there's a here and an over there, there's always going to be a sense of dissatisfaction. You want to be everywhere all at once, as long as there's a place. So in one way, the, one way the Buddha is saying we're going to take the mind to a place, but well, take it out of place entirely. Where, as some of the passages say, neither here nor there nor in between. And you think about it this way, it can get quite complex. But he says the, the, the problem is right in the craving with the ignorance. Focus on that, and then the implications of what it means to let go of craving by developing a knowledge will become a lot clearer. You'll know for yourself what it means not to have a place, not to be located in anything. As I say, the arahant experiences feelings disjoined from them. The feeling is there, the sense of pleasure or pain in the body, but there's a sense of disconnection because you don't go into the feeling. Or you don't take a stance outside of the feeling. It's because the mind doesn't have a place anymore. The feelings come, the feelings go, but it's just their business. Our business is not to wander after them or wander away from them. And so to do that, we need to focus on precisely what the problem is the craving and the ignorance. I was reading a book recently on the issue of problem solving, recognizing a problem, noticing when your intuitive sense of how to solve the problem is right, and learning how to observe when it's not. One essential thing is realizing that you don't need to know everything about a problem in order to solve it. You need to know just a few factors. In fact, if you clutter your mind up with too much information about the problem, you paralyze yourself or can mislead yourself very easily. The book was talking about a hospital, Cook County Hospital in Chicago, which was having a lot of problems because it was way understaffed and way overburdened, and a lot of people were coming and reporting chest pain. And they had only a few emergency care units where they could look after people who actually were having heart attacks or were about to have heart attacks. And the question was, how do you figure out who coming with chest pain is just having indigestion or something else, and who's actually having a heart attack? And the new administrator had read of someone who'd done research years back, figuring out what the really crucial signs were. Had gone over hospital records from many hospitals over many years and come up with just a few variables. In addition to the EKG, he looked at the question of is there fluid in the lungs? Is the systolic pressure less than 100? Is the pain erratic? And if the question answered all those three questions was yes, then the person was either having a heart attack or about to deserved emergency care. Otherwise, no. And when the administrator asked the doctors in the hospital to try looking for just these factors, the doctors rebelled. They said, well, we have to go on our experience. We have to realize that there are many other factors involved. can't be just these three. So the administrator said, OK, we'll take an experiment, because it turned out nobody had ever experimented on the data that this one scientist had put together. So for two years, we'll do things the way you've been doing them, looking at all the different variables and coming up with your decisions. And then for the next two years, we'll try this system. And I forget the precise figures. It was something like, it turned out that of the 
the normal way it's done. It was 60 to 70 percent of the cases actually were having heart attacks of the people who were admitted to the emergency care. Then with focusing just on those three variables, it went up to something like 95, 96 percent, much higher accuracy. So the Buddha has us focus in the same way on just a few factors, just a few variables, the ones that are crucial, and put aside everything else. This is why he's so careful about which questions he answered and which ones he didn't, and why his teaching doesn't get into the issue of, are we all a oneness? Are we all individual beings? Is the world a oneness? Is it not? What happens to the, the person who gains awakening? Does he or she exist? not exist, both, neither? Is the world eternal? Is it not? Is it infinite? Is it not? All these questions that he avoided, because those weren't the issue. The issue is, where is your ignorance? Where is your craving? Is it the kind of craving that leads to further becoming? Okay, that's going to be a problem. And exactly what is it you have to be knowledgeable about? The Four Noble Truths. You might call them the Four Noble Factors for solving a problem. Just looking at the suffering. Where is the stress right now? What comes along with it? What can you do to abandon the stress or get put an end to the stress by abandoning its cause? So watch the movements of your mind in the terms of those four factors. And usually we don't because we have a movements of our mind are like arrows. They're pointing someplace and they hope to get someplace else. And we're focused entirely on the place you want to get. We don't look at the arrow itself. We don't look at the act of shooting the arrow, all these other things that are happening in the mind. As long as our knowledge is simply of what we're after, we're missing the Four Noble Truths. They're in the process. You want to see the process as it happens in these four, in terms of these four factors. But you can take it apart in that way and act appropriately in line with each of the four factors. In other words, try to comprehend the stress. Let go of the cause, let go of the factor that's accompanying the stress. Watch that happening. Be clear about the letting go. Because the letting go is itself a type of act. And develop the qualities that enable you, enable you to let go more and more precisely. Develop those qualities. Work on them. If you look at the movements of your mind from this perspective, it takes them apart. So whether the movement is heading toward a specific state or it's trying to head toward oblivion, not oblivion, oblivion, annihilation. Watch the process. Don't go wrong, long for the ride. And as the Buddha promises it, when you apply this approach, suffering ends. And what are the ramifications in terms of existence, non-existence, space, time, lack of space, lack of time? You find that out for yourself. And sometimes it's fun to play around with the whole idea, what's it like not having space or time? But all we can come up with if we approach it that way. There's a lot of different theories, mind-boggling and fun to think about, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Focus on the four issues that the Buddha said are really crucial, the four factors. And then when there comes an end to space and time, you'll know what it's like. And you realize that the Buddha is right. This is the solution to the problem. Focus on these four factors. Don't worry about other things. So when the mind wanders, as it's going to do in the course of the hour, realize that it's not just a problem in terms of developing concentration. 
get the mind concentrated, and then learn to look in a very subtle way at the movements. And if you apply the Buddhist approach, you'll, that's how you learn. That's how you learn what the problem is, that's how you learn how to solve it, what the solution is, what it's like to have it solved. So there's no longer any felt need to keep on wandering. <laughs>